Good morning, and welcome to First Christian Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Swansea, Massachusetts. My name is Karen Gale, and I serve as the intentional interim pastor of this community of faith. We're so glad that you're here worshiping with us this morning. So let us join together in hopeful and joyful worship to experience God's presence in our midst and in our life. Peace be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the God of hope and love. Thanks be to God for this day. Thanks be to God for this community of welcome and hope. In desperation, we found freedom. In freedom, we found love. In love, we found devotion. In devotion, Spirit found us in desperation. We found freedom in freedom. We found love in love. We found devotion. In devotion, Spirit found us. In desperation, we found freedom. In freedom, we found join with me in this morning's call to worship. We gather to hear the good news of Jesus. Worship unites us together even when we are apart. We come carrying losses in this difficult time. We are weighed down by goodbyes and uncertainty and missing loved ones. God is near to us as close as breathing as present as the earth under our feet. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. In joy and sorrow, loss and boredom, celebration and disappointment, God is God and we are God's people, now and always, amen. Let us join together 
in a spirit of prayer, let us pray. God, some days we are tired. Tired of living this new yet old life of separation and worry. Tired of saying goodbye to people who move or leave or withdraw in anger or die. We are tired of the struggle to be better people, even as we know we are called to challenge our inheritances of racism and inequality and indifference. God, someday we mourn our losses and wonder where you are. Some days we feel lost. Some days we long for the good old days while knowing those days were only good for some. God, we are your bruised and weary people. Remind us of your presence and your hope. Shelter us when we grieve and heal us in our despair. Receive our repentance and knit us back together as a community of faith. For we seek your grace and need your guiding hand through another day. We pray as followers of Jesus. Amen. I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about the 4th of July. I usually like the 4th of July. I love watching the fireworks, but I have to admit, this year I was pretty bummed out. We usually go over to our good friends' houses, houses and we have a big barbecue and we get together and we hang out, but this year we couldn't. In fact, it was really important that we shouldn't because we have some really special people that we love in our life and it's really important to keep them safe and make sure that they didn't get sick. I think we're probably all feeling about the same way. We're pretty bummed out about something. Maybe you're missing going to sports practices or maybe even missing going to school. 
hanging out with your friends and family. This coronavirus has affected everything that we do, and it's hard to feel bummed out about everything. When we're feeling bummed, or feeling sad, or feeling anxious, we usually try to do something to make, it, make ourselves feel better, right? One of the easiest things that we can do is talk to somebody that we trust. We can always talk to God and maybe talk to our mom or dad or brother or sister or a friend or a teacher. You could even call the church and talk to Pastor Karen or myself. Talking can help us feel better and we might also come up with some really good ideas about how we can still do the really important things in our life in new ways you would be really surprised at how many grandparents are getting really good at FaceTime. And grandparents, I'm looking at you right now. If my mom can do it, so can you. Pray with me. Holy God, please help us feel your presence here in this scary moment where we feel like everything is changing. Help us to remember that your love comes to us in drive-by parades to say goodbye and in using FaceTime to say hello. Help us to recognize it even when it's disguised as something new. Amen. This reading is from Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 8. This is the New Revised Standard Version. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter unto heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Here ends the reading. This reading is from Romans 8, verses 26 to 28, 37 to 39. This is the message version. The moment we get tired in waiting, God's Spirit is right along helping us along. If we don't know how to or what to pray, it doesn't matter. God does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. God knows us better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, knows us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Here 
ends the reading. Will you pray with me? God, surround us with love that we may truly love one another. Amen. This past week, I was taking the dog for a walk and I walked past the house of a good friend of mine. We'd been texting and chatting these past few months, but each of us have vulnerable parents, so we've been very careful and mostly just staying home alone. It was so great to see her. Her face lit up. Mine did too, I'm sure. We each started to walk towards each other for a hug. She is a great hugger. And then we stopped short. We couldn't hug. We laughed about old habits in this crazy time and chatted some more before I walked on. And then I nearly burst into tears. No hug. It is a small loss, but somehow in my heart it felt and still feels like such a big loss. I couldn't hug my friend, the one who is still grieving the loss of a parent this year, the one who sat with us as we struggled to figure out what help our son needed. No hugs. It hurt. It still hurts. There are a lot of things we are all grieving right now. Some of us have lost a loved one to COVID or a loved one has died during COVID. And to make that death even harder, we can't have the kind of memorial or funeral or celebration to mark our loved one's passing. No hugs. Some of us have fragile family members or folks who are unable to venture out in this pandemic. And we have seen them only through Zoom or through a glass window parents, children, grandparents, folks who have long-term illnesses, and we can't sit with them, can't hold their hand. No hugs. And this week, you all said goodbye to your longtime settled pastor, Pastor Holly, a loss of another kind, a different kind of grieving. But there was no fellowship hall bash, even though a car parade was a pretty great alternative. But it meant no hugs. And finally, the place where we would usually come to grieve those losses, to sit with one another side by side in the congregation, to sing our laments in the sanctuary, to share in personal and collective prayers. Well, we can adapt and have those services online, but sitting apart in our homes, there is one thing that is surely missing among many. No hugs. For sitting even six feet apart, there are no hugs. And my sense is that you all would be a hugging church. The words from Ecclesiastes this morning are familiar ones. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. The book of Ecclesiastes is also known as Koheleth, which means teacher or preacher. The book is set up as an unknown teacher reflecting on life and the role of wisdom. It was a popular style about two to three hundred years before Jesus was born. Reflections by leaders on life and its meaning were ancient day hot reads. Traditionally, folks have said that King Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, but modern scholars believe it was written much later 
by a leader in Jerusalem surveying the destruction and devastation of that city at the hands of some neighboring empire. It is a very different book than any other in our Bible, as its main message is that our efforts in life are in vain and it is impossible to figure out meaning. Very strange, for our Bible texts stress over and over that God is present. God is love. Our lives are important. And especially in difficult times of grief, God draws near. But I do think this book of Ecclesiastes captures a very real feeling of grief and mourning and frustration and apathy that we might feel in the face of death or loss or crisis. Honestly, for me, these words are comforting. They speak to the human experience, the experience of faith-filled people, all people really, throughout the ages. This is my first pandemic, but there have been pandemics in the past. People have died in great numbers in the past. Human beings have endured great losses and somehow, through work and faith and hope and each other, they have come through. Through mourning to the other side, whenever and however that other side emerged. This is not new this experience, there is a path, a path through this wilderness. I was an English major in college, and like every other English major, I read The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. This book is a collection of stories written in the 1300s, and the stories are told by a fictional group of people who are waiting out the Black Death, the bubonic plague in Italy. Some stories are funny, some are sad, some are strange. And the author gives us this unusual collection of people, rich and poor, workers and elite, clergy and tradespeople, and they pass their time in confinement, their time in lockdown, telling stories about life and what meaning they have found. Chaucer's book was then and still is a bestseller. Why? I think again, it is a path forward, a road in this wilderness of confusion and unknowns, a guide in a certain sense, and crucially, the importance of stories and telling stories to one another. Our faith is a collection of stories, a collection that is both written in the scriptures that we have and continually being added to by our individual experiences and our experiences together as a congregation. We are story people. We learn and laugh and remember and forgive and move on into another day through shared stories. Jesus' best material is his stories, his parables. Stories remind us that others have come through losses and we will too. And whether it is the big losses that we grieve, parents, friends, family members who have died, or the myriad other losses in this time, unemployment, missed birthdays and anniversaries, graduations, not seeing new babies, no hugs. God is present as we grieve. As a community of faith, we can be present to one another through prayer, cards, video chats, car parades, yelling hello from the very end of the driveway, rock ladybugs that just show up. We are the people of God and we are a resilient people. Through the millennia, through tragedy, through new ways of gathering and being, we have gone on. I mean, thank goodness, at least we're not meeting in catacombs right now, you know? And we should be continually knit back together through all that we do in love and respect and outreach to one another. Our stories, our stories of faith. There's a radio program that airs on National Public Radio called StoryCorps. Its mission is to collect stories from people all around the United States by having loved ones or friends or coworkers interview one another. I listen to the stories often, and if I miss them on the radio, I go online to listen or read them. The power of stories is amazing, and for me, it is healing. I went on recently 
to hear folks talk about their experience of COVID-19. And among the many stories, I heard this one between a father, Dr. Joseph Krass, and his 18-year-old daughter, Sophie. He's a hospice doctor. She's in high school. They live in St. Louis, Missouri. And what I really appreciated about their story is that it covers the whole range of emotions that we are all feeling right now. Grief, anger, fear, responsibility, loss, powerlessness, what we want and can't have, and ultimately love. Dr. Kras starts the interview by saying to his daughter, at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, you got really, really mad at me that I kept going to work, to hospice and palliative care. And she responds, yes, I was mad at you because I felt like you were choosing your work over your family and me. Whenever you talked about your duty as a physician, my mind would just turn that around as, what about your duty as a father? You could save them, but you could end up killing me. And he says back to her, if I should infect somebody in my own family and they should die or get very sick, of course I'd be guilty forever about that. How do you balance other duties that you have in your life, including, of course, that to your own family? And so here's the thing. If I don't do it, who is going to? Is everybody going to step back and not go in as a doctor? Would I want other physicians to turn their back on you if you were sick? Absolutely not. So she goes on, so I've always wondered, how do you talk to patients who are dying? And he thoughtfully replies, you know, they are owed honesty above all else. And so I give them that. But people need to know that you're going to walk the path with them, whatever that path might be. I had this one patient, her longstanding partner was not allowed to come into the hospital and she was getting near the end of life. And the last time that this person was going to be talking before she decided to go on a ventilator was to us, to me, and not to her partner. There was just the sense of aloneness that was over the room and me trying to be present because sometimes that's the most and the least you can do for your patients. But sometimes, you know, that's not enough. I think if you're a good doctor, a lot of your patients take a little chunk out of you every now and then. His daughter Sophie then says, if I think about it harder, which I've had a lot of time to do since school stopped, I realize that being a physician is hard. And even though I don't really tell you, I really admire that you go out there and confront these contagious diseases and people who are dying and people who are angry and sad. And he concludes, there's things sometimes you can't change and you just do your best. But I gotta say, one of the things I missed most is giving you a hug. And uh, when this is all over, it's one of the things I want to do. We are not in this alone. People have walked these roads of grief and loss before us. People have found their way through pandemics before us. People of faith have written about the faithfulness of God for generations before us. We may not know how this will all turn out, and we may be bogged down with so many emotions in the moment, but we are not alone. We have God, we have faith, we have each other, and we have stories to guide us. In Paul's words to the Romans, that's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is working into something good. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And someday, someday in a newly bright and virus-free future, there shall be hugs all around. Amen.
Will you pray with me? God of hope and wholeness, we come to you this morning as a people in mourning. There are so many losses in our lives right now. People we have lost to death with the coronavirus. People that we miss, that we no longer see regularly. We mourn the loss of school and camp and work and seeing old and new friends. This morning we pray for the members and friends of FCCC, particularly those who are healing, those who are moving through the dying process, those who are vulnerable and cannot leave their homes. Be with them and us in this oh so challenging time. We pray for our church and our community of faith as we wrestle with how to be a congregation right now, how to worship, how to gather, how to conduct the business of the church, how to love one another with grace and in the way Jesus asks us to. We are thankful and grateful for all those who can now participate virtually in our worship together. But we also grieve the loss of all those folks for whom that's not possible. This week in particular, we grieve the loss of Pastor Holly and ask for your blessing on her and her family in this transition time. We are grateful for all the ministry that she and this congregation worked on together and all the people who were served and loved and brought back into wholeness and brought into community. All the ways in which she brought the light of Christ to this church. We pray for our nation and our world where there is so much division and so much death that it makes us hard to even engage with the news of the day. And yet we know, we believe, we have faith that nothing can separate us from your love, not war, not death, not disease, not living apart. Nothing can separate us from you and the love that we know through the life of Jesus. Hear our prayers right now as we offer them to you either silently or aloud. Gracious God, you are our healer, our rock, the constant in an inconstant world. Gather up all these prayers as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples in words that are faithful for us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to this morning's offering. There are a lot of ways we can support the church during this pandemic time. We can continue to offer our tithes and our financial gifts through the mail slot, through the mail, online giving. We also can offer the church our time through meetings and organizing and committee work. We offer the church our talents. Perhaps your talent is writing a note to those who can't get out. But in all these different ways, we offer what we can to God, thanking God for being the blessed giver to all of us in our lives. So again, I invite you to this morning's offering to offer out of your heart into the vast loving heart of God and God's ministry worked out through this church. Will you join me in the unison prayer of dedication? Thank you, God, for the invitation to give. When we share our money, our fear about having enough diminishes. When we share our time, we focus less on ourselves and more on our neighbor. When we share our talents, we remember that we are needed. Gather up all these gifts and all these givers, as together we are the church and called to share Jesus' love in so many wonderful ways. Amen.
And now may God's love surround you. May Christ's presence comfort you. May the Holy Spirit fill you such that the light of Christ shines through you for all to see. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Amen.